Good morning or afternoon or evening, uh, whatever the case may be. Of course, we're coming to you virtually today. I'd like to welcome you to UCLA Getty Conservation Program's inaugural Distinguished Lecture. I'm Darnell Hunt, Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA. The strong collection or collaboration between UCLA and the Getty has made this the premier conservation program on the West Coast. Within the social sciences, our motto is engaging LA, changing the world, and the UCLA Getty Conservation Program is no exception. The program continues to be a leader in not only advancing the preservation of cultural heritage materials, but in expanding access to conservation by offering training, workshops, and mentorships to underrepresented populations. We are honored today to have Dr. Spencer Crew from the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture today to address the important preserving the past for future generations. It is my pleasure to introduce the director of our program, Professor Glenn Warden. Thank you, Darnell, for those wonderful words. Before we begin, I'd like to say, as a land-grant institution, our program at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the, the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. I'm very happy to welcome everyone to our inaugural, inaugural lecture today. Um, I can't see you, but at last count, we had approximately 850 RSVPs, so I know you're out there. Given the size of the audience, we won't be able to interact with live questions or through chat. Instead, Dr. Crew and I will have a discussion following his lecture. Some of you send in questions in advance that I'll be able to ask him. Before I introduce Dr. Crew, I'd like to just say a word about our program. The UCLA Getty Conservation Program is the only conservation graduate program in the Western United States and the only program in the country that focuses on archeological and indigenous materials. We offer MA and PhD degrees in study and conservation of cultural materials. And our primary values include diversity, collaboration with representatives of cultures associated with the objects in our care, and environmental sustainability. Our intention with this series is to highlight how cultural heritage conservation engages with larger social and political issues. It's certainly my belief that objects from the past embody narratives that can be revealed through their study, conservation, display, and activation. We will invite speakers in this series, starting with Dr. Crew, who can speak about these narratives along with our critical engagement of the past. The acting director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Before accepting this position, he had an impressive career from, uh, working for public history institutions for more than 30 years. He's on leave from George Mason University, where he's the Clarence R. Robinson Professor of History. Previous to Mason, he served as president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for six years and worked at the National Museum of African Hist of American History for 30 years. Nine of those years, he served as its director. At each of these institutions, he sought to make history accessible to the public through innovative and inclusive exhibitions and public programs. Dr. Crew has, has published extensively in the areas of African his American history and public history. His latest book is Thorgood Marshall, A Life in American History. He's a graduate of Brown University and holds master's degrees and a, and a doctorate degree from Rutgers University. With that, I welcome Dr. Spencer Crew. Thank you, Glenn. And it's a real pleasure to have the chance to be here with you this afternoon and to talk a little bit about some of the uh, things that I have learned while being a part of the Smithsonian and in the museum field. Uh, let me start with a reference to a book, first slide, that came out in 1998. Uh, that book was an important one for, muse for museum professionals and for historians, and it was entitled, as you can see, The Presence of the Past, Popular Uses of History in American Life, written by Roy Rosenzweig and David Phelan. 
Its main thesis was that the general public was much more interested in history than we really realized. Uh, what was important about the book is that what they captured was that while people were interested in history, they didn't say that I liked history. They said other kinds of things. They sort of manifest this interest in history through their work in family genealogy, through antique collecting, stories about uh, the town or the city in which they lived, or house, historic houses in the town or landmarks in their town. All these things were historical places, but they didn't refer to them as thinking about history. I should say that as a child, my family often his, visited historical places in and around the state of Ohio where I grew up. We never thought of ourselves as historians. We just thought of, uh, of ourselves as visitors. Though I will say that I must admit it probably did help stir my own interest in history in later years. Now the publishing of this book provided important positive news for historians because they, at the time they were very worried that history was no longer of relevance relevance to individuals and therefore was not something they were interested in. But also within the book was encouraging news for people who worked in museums and historic places such as the places uh, where I've worked. What it said was that one of the most trusted sources for the presentation of history were museums because they believed that they were an important place in which people could learn, begin to learn about these issues of, of, of historical importance. What made museums important in their eyes though, which is interesting, was it was the objects and the use of artifacts in these exhibitions that really made people excited. They valued the opportunity to uh, engage with these objects. They also very much valued the ability to begin to add their own interpretation and understanding of what these objects had to offer, to think about its meaning to them in con connection with their own lives and their own experiences. And they saw how these objects then began to fit into how they thought they ought to be thought about and talked about in the museums. What the past learnings or memories or their experiences. So these objects were key connectors to past thoughts. Sometimes the opportunity that these ob objects offered was a chance to create what some scholars have referred to as a Newman experience. That is a moment when one's connection to the object is special in some useful kind of way. It may provoke a sense of reverence or awe for the object, or it may connect to special experiences in the viewer's life, which is particularly significant. I'm sure we've all have gone to a historic place, to a museum, to an art museum, and had a Newman experience where the connection was special for you in terms of your uh, viewing of that object. It's, a, it's a really a moment when the memories of the individual begin to dominate how they see the artifact and the interpretations connected with it. But in museums and historic places, the challenge is whether the memory is in accord with the interpretation of the history of the individual that's coming forward. That sometimes can be a discord that can cause some challenges. And what it can do is when one goes to a museum can make their experience a positive one or can make it one that's disconcerting and maybe not as happy as they'd like it to be. I think what complicates this interaction is that history and memory, which are at play here, really do not always coincide. In fact, they can also often be seen at odds at one another in terms of what they try to accomplish. There's a scholar by the name of Peter Nora, let's see the next slide, who has argued that history and memory are at war with one another. He believes that memories are constantly changing as a result of outside influences. Your memory of something, one's memory of something can be impacted by a conversation with someone else, by reading something new or different, hearing something different, or, uh, or, or having an interaction with someone who sees the world in a slightly different kind of way. This is in contrast to how we think about history. History, on the other hand, I think seeks to accurately define past events, not to, and not to have the point of view easily changed quickly, but you have to do a lot of research and fact checking before you begin to change what history has to say. As Nora would often say, history seeks to freeze memory and not to allow it to continue to evolve. For Nora, memory has to keep to evolve. It's always changing. It's hard to freeze it in time as history tries to do. For historians, uh, the only way you change history is through the research and the background that you can do over a period of time to really make that thing uh, definite and to be well supported. 
So you have this clash between history and memory, I think, that are, are part of the, the things that challenge us that work in history museums or in historical places. Uh, and, and part, as I said, because the historical view may not always coincide with what the, uh, the viewer brings to the table. I think this is particularly the case, this clash can happen when you have a topic that is in a, a long held tradition that may not be seen in the same way as in history as it is in the memory of individuals. For example, we can look at the very strong differing views about Confederate statues and, uh, and or the causes of the Civil War. Next slide. There are those who believe that the Civil War was not about the preservation of history. Next slide, please. But they thought more it was a war about the aggression of the North on the South. Uh, go back a slide, please. And the South's effort to preserve their way of life. So for them, these statues that they created are really symbols of their way of life and of the aggression that they felt. Now, the opposing view is that the Civil War was a war of rebellion against the Union, against the United States, against the Constitution. And, they, and, it, and, it, was there, and it was in place as a way of preserving slavery and that way of life. The disagreement, I think, carries over uh, into issues of how we think about the Civil War and how we think about Civil War statues and also how we think about the stars and bars on, on flags like, such as that in Mississippi. I think these differing long-held memories or traditions can run counter to what the historical record really uh, illustrates. So we have again a clash between memory and tradition and what history has told us through the research. I think this kind of clash, this kind of discord can make the work of places like museums much more challenging because they have to consider the, what, consider the memories brought by the visitors as they assemble the historical inter interpretations. In a museum, in a public place, you really have to think about what visitors are bringing in terms of experiences as you begin to craft the exhibitions and the presentations that you, you are trying to put into place. What you wanna do is to find ways to make the presentation you offer. And I think for public historians, artifacts and material culture help to create that larger context and hopefully help to stimulate connections which reinforce their interpretations they're trying to offer to the public and hopefully do not clash dramatically with the memories that people are bringing. Now I talked about the Newman experience earlier and, and I think this is where when objects can create very useful and powerful connections. And they can really help I think to punctuate the idea of the interpretation that one is trying to create an exhibition or a public presentation. It helps to make the issue under discussion much more tangible and much more real to the viewer Objects can do that, and objects, I think, are very important in that sense. It allows the visitor sometimes to connect to these things in sometimes wonderful, but also sometimes unexpected ways. I think a great example of this can be seen in an exhibition that was done by the Smithsonian Institution many years ago. Next slide, please. It was an exhibition that was created in Japan and the idea of it was to highlight some of the treasures of the Smithsonian for the people of, of Japan. The title of the exhibition, as you can see here, was The Smithsonian's America, an exhibition on American history and culture. It included 300 objects, which mainly came from the National Museum of American History and from the National Air and Space Museum. The exhibit was a wonderful, ex wonderful uh, ex uh, success uh, in ways we sometimes did not expect. And we, I think we, in part, we were nicely surprised by the reaction that Japanese visitors had to the exhibition and particularly to the objects that we had to share with them. It was not unusual when we went to observe to see visitors wiping away tears as they view some of the objects in the exhibitions. For example, in particular, the Abraham Lincoln's hat that you see here, this is the hat that he wore the night he was assassinated, was a very, had a I think connected with the hat, uh, connected with the history that, we, that, we, that went with it had a very profound impact upon our visitors. And it really was not unusual to find people in tears in this space standing in front of this and other objects because of the connection they made to the history and the object and their memories that went with it. That, I think that is why museum collections are a critical focal point uh, for its reason for existence. Museums and objects are bound together, I think, in ways that cannot be separated. Objects are the key elements 
and the creation of exhibitions, uh, as I mentioned earlier. The other role I think of objects is, is uh, in uh, museums is that collections held by museums represent sometimes irreplaceable remnants from the past that while we are trying to use them in exhibitions, we're also using them as ways of capturing the past and making sure it's not lost. Museums seek to ensure in the collecting of objects that they are not lost or destroyed by time or by other issues. What we want to do is to preserve artifacts that represent important moments in the lives of a culture, in the life of a nation or of organizations or of individuals. It helps us to remember and not to forget that what about things that once mattered to us as a nation or as people. And it may also allow the viewer to better understand how things in the past functioned and how they worked. I had a wonderful example of a colleague who came to the American History Museum years ago who had done some writing about uh, steam locomotives, but had never had a chance to really get up to, close to one uh, nearby and to observe how it looked and how it operated. When he had the chance to actually get up and see that steam engine, it changed how he thought about its operation. It changed how he thought about the work of the engineer. And I think it also impacted the kind of writing he did in the future. And I think that's what that connection to objects can do. It can allow us to have new insights into their meaning, into their operation, and how to think about the work that, that they provide or the impact they have on their society. I think in museums, objects also play an important role in, in determining what stories are conveyed in their exhibitions and in their public presentations. And I think it's much harder to do this effectively when artifacts are not available and are conserve, conserved for presentations. So they're collecting and preservation becomes an important part of that process. One of the ideas often said by some organizations is that they cannot offer exhibitions on one group or another because they do not have the artifacts to support the presentation. It's uh, a, a sort of sometimes used to be the watchword in museums that if you don't have the stuff, you can't tell the story. So they would not do exhibitions on certain topics or certain individual groups because they didn't have those objects. I know this is an explanation you often hear when uh, museums talk about their inability to, to do exhibitions about African-Americans, about Lat Latinos, about other uh, groups because they argue they may not have enough objects to tell that story. I think that is a result of, of the fact that they did not take the time to do collecting in those communities, in those places in previous years. Instead, they've been focused on much more traditional history with, which meant they uh, really looked at the lives of notable indiv individuals, mostly men, and traditionally defined important moments in American history without looking more broadly at the social history and other things that are taking place. Some also argue, I think along the same line, that there was not very much way in the way of material culture preserved and available to tell the African-American story. This is one of the many arguments that were offered uh, against the early years of its uh, conversations about creating it. What they are argued is that they did not believe there were enough objects in existence and preserved to support the creation of an entire museum dedicated to African-American history and culture. Indeed, the building of the collection was one of the key challenges confronting the museum at its very beginning. Uh, next slide, please. As you can tell, the museum is a massive structure. Next slide. And the challenge was with a building this large, more than 400,000 square feet, how are you going to collect enough objects to fill it, to do, uh, to do the exhibitions that were necessary? Please go back to the building slide, please. Um, and indeed, the challenge of getting collections was that um, this, the National Museum of African American History and Culture began its existence with no collections whatsoever, which means it had to start That are important. This is unlike any other museum that I can think of in terms of how they really began to get uh, going, especially at the Smithsonian. For example, at the National Museum of the American Indian, which opened in 2004, they had a sizable collection they could use in advance of their opening. They had, had over 800,000 objects that had been collected by George uh, High uh, 
or which had been made available to them to use. It had been stored in New York City and they were able to bring it down and use it in Washington, DC. Uh, in contrast, the National Museum of African American History and Culture had to work quickly and hard to begin to locate and conser conserve and preserve artifacts to tell the story of the African American uh, history from the colonial period of the nation to the very present time. So we had a lot of challenges in terms of, we had to build a collection very quickly. Next slide. I think the, the past experience made the staff feel confident that material culture existed, but the challenge was how to bring to the surface I, uh, and to get key material to donate, to use in the new museum. The challenge for us was how to locate and acquire thousands of objects that were needed to populate the exhibitions in this very new, wonderful museum. The staff had to come up with something very creative way to make this happen. One concept that took, I think, took root for us was to take advantage of a format of a, of a, a way of operating that had already been put in uh, use by public broadcasting television. It was a program called the Antique Roadshow, which many of you may be aware of. Essentially what they would do is go to different cities and encourage people to bring their items to the, uh, to the experts to have them assessed and, and, to, and have a value put upon them. Very often, there'd be times when people had things in their homes that they hadn't considered very valuable, but turned out to have great worth. the country in search of America's hidden treasures. The National Museum of African American History and Culture staff decided to take a, a page out of that book and to create their own program, which is the variation on, on that theme. They created what you see here is a program called Save Our African American Treasures. What the program was, was uh, sought, set, set up to do was to create a collaboration among various cultural institutions community leaders, and the public across the country to preserve and collect African-American material culture at, located in these communities. The goal was to encourage citizens in different cities to come to a central location and to bring the items of importance to them they wanted to have saved, as you can see this woman here. Smithsonian staff with different, with different areas of expertise would come to these locations, and they would come there to provide information about how the material brought by the public might be best conserved and preserved. And what we tried to do is to encourage people to bring all kinds of material culture, and they did. It ranged from textiles, to furniture, to clothing, to photographs, to letters, books, and many other things that they had stored away in their basements and their attics. On their side of it, next slide, the Smithsonian brought acid-free boxes, acid-free photographic sleeves, and other archival materials and ideas for conserving the objects at the gathering. As you can see here, a woman has brought in a quilt that belonged to her family. And we have our uh, conservatives taking a look at it and telling her more about it and more about what it represents in terms of the, the uh, stitching work as well as the patterns that are located on it. Our first goal in these kind of gatherings was, to, uh, was not to try and collect material culture for the African American Museum of History and Culture. Instead, what we wanted to do was first of all, to help them save and preserve for us. What we did not want them to do is to fear that the Smithsonian would come in and take their material culture away from them and they would lose it forever. We also wanted to make sure that local museums were not worried that again, the Smithsonian would come in and rob their community of all the kind of artifacts that they might find useful in their personal history. Our main goal with these activities was to let people know that the effort to build our museum was underway. And we wanted them to know that our museum was collecting and that there were artifacts and material culture, which was part of their, fa their family history. that are important parts of African-American and American history. That was key for us because very often people did not put great value on the things that they had saved in, in their own lives from their own families. And we wanted to let them know that those stories connected with those artifacts those pieces of material culture were all important remnants of hi history, American and African-American history. And that for museums and historical places, collecting that material culture was key. It was important to have for us to be able to share these with future generations. The, I think the results of these gatherings that we sponsored were beneficial to everyone involved. 
Lots of material was conserved and preserved and people could take them home. Local institutions were made more aware of the resources in their communities, which they might be able to borrow or use in the future. And as a result, in some cases, we were able to make acquisitions for the museum as some people came to these sessions expressly with the material that they wished the museum to have. One of our most exciting artifacts to acquire came as a result of a gathering we had like this in Atlanta. There, a woman brought with her a hat she believed to Marcus Garvey. Next slide, please. Marcus Garvey, if you don't know him, was an early 20th century figure who led a very popular Back to Africa and uh, Black Pride movement here in the United States and around the world. It's been argued by some scholars that it was the largest worldwide African-American movement uh, ever in the history of the, of, the, of the world. And part of what he sought to do was to purchase ships and to sell goods and people back to Africa, back to the homeland. Uh, he was arrested by the United States, some would, some would say on um, trumped up charges, and he was then put in federal prison in Atlanta, a place where he'd also come to speak on occasion. How the woman acquired the hat it really was not clear to us, but she, she did make a good case for its authenticity. So what we decided to do was to have our conservation and preservation people and others do a lot of research on the fibers, the style and other characteristics to confirm its provenance. In the end, after a great deal of close examination and uh, uh, many days of, of, of research, they decided as best they could determine that it was authentic and the museum took it into its collection. I think other positive uh, additions to the collection also emerged from these gatherings because not only were they impactful in the cities where we went to, but it allowed the word to spread outward and to let other people know across the country that in fact, the National Museum of African American Culture and History was going to happen and that we were looking for objects that people were willing to donate to the museum. Uh, as a point of emphasis, the director of the museum then, Lonnie Bunch, who's now the secretary of the Smithsonian, he felt that we had to ensure that our exhibitions told good stories that made connections to the visitors. And he felt that good research, powerful objects and artifacts and engaging history was of the utmost importance for us to be successful. The more objects we could obtain, which provided that connection, the better we would be, the more useful we would be to our visitors. He also wanted people to understand how important objects were to the success of the museum. It was difficult to create an African-American museum with African-American exhibitions to tell an African-American story. The more the people understood the historical significance of the materials they, they have had in their basements or their attics or their garages, the easier it would be for us to tell these stories. Also, I think the greater chances for the, our museum uh, to be able to get these pieces of material culture and then to conserve them and to preserve them for, for later generations. We not only wanted to share them as exhibitions, but we also wanted to bring them into the collection and make sure that 10, 20, 30, 100 years from now, they were still available for people to see, to observe, and to learn from. Fortunately, we were able to, to collect, I think, a number of objects that had a great deal of impact as a result of our activities. Let me tell you about two of those objects uh, that came into our collection. The first of these uh, was a casket that was uh, acquired indirectly. It's a casket. Emmett Till. He was from Chicago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead to Emmett Till. He was from Chicago. And it was said that he insulted while visiting relatives in Mississippi, the wife of a local white store owner. Uh, not too much long later, the husband and friends kidnapped Emmett Till and later his battered body was found a few days later. His mother had his body returned to Chicago and had an open casket funeral to show what had happened to him. I often love to quote her words when she said she wanted the world to see what they had done to her baby. And um, many have argued that this moment in time, this open casket funeral was an important catalyst for the modern civil rights movement as a lot of people decided they no longer could allow quietly these kinds of indignities to happen to Afri African-Americans. In fact, Rosa Parks said when she sat on the back of the bus in Montgomery, she thought about Emmett Till. In 2005, his body was exhumed for DNA test 
Alaska was stored in a shed for several years. Next slide, please. In 2009, with the permission of the family, the museum obtained the casket for exhibition on your upper left. Um, what we had to do in order to think about conserving and re restoring that casket was to, first of all, make contact with the original casket company maker. They had to help us think about what was the right material to have in that casket, along with what was the right way to treat the exterior of that, uh, of that object. And what we wanted to do was to restore it uh, to the conditions that it had been in during the time of the funeral. But what we had to make sure is we did this in the most respect, respectful way because this was an important icon uh, in the history of African-Americans. We understood that it had significance to very many people, uh, both from that time period, but also in today's world. We also wanted the family to feel that we treated the casket in his memory. Serving it, we created a special area in the museum where the public could view it and understand its importance in America, in American history. You can see the, the uh, conserved object on your lower right. This object has become one of the most iconic objects in our museum and people line up and wait patiently for uh, many, many minutes to get a chance to see it and to learn that story. The other important object I wanted to talk about in terms of the conservation that went on in the, in the museum is a uh, airplane that we have. It's called the PT-13D. Next slide, please. It's a Stearman cadet aircraft that we have hanging from the, the ceiling in one of our history galleries. It has a wonderful story. It was donated to the museum by Air Force Captain Matt Kwai. He originally bought this airplane, which had been wrecked in a uh, crash in 2005. He bought it sight unseen by telephone. This began a three-year effort to repair the plane. So this had been an airplane that Tuskegee pilots had used to train at Morgan, Morton, Morton, Morton Field in Tuskegee, Alabama. It's an interesting story because these were African-American men in World War II who had to lobby the White House to get the opportunity to train to be pilots to fight in the Air Force for their country. What they formed, among others, was the 33rd Fighter Group that was deployed in April 1943. They flew more than 1,500 missions over Italy and the Mediterranean from bases in North Africa. They are famous for never having lost a bomber who they were bomber escorts in the time that they were assigned to, the, to, to protect them. When our museum learned about Kwai and how he had restored the airplane and how he was flying it around the country to air shows and getting Tuskegee Airmen to autograph it and to then get a, fly, a, a, a ride in it, we asked him if he would consider giving, having the museum take control over it. His family agreed and they donated the plane to the museum in 2009. It is now another treasured part of the museum and a, a, an object that I think helps again, tells an important part of the story of African-American contribution to the United States. And it's one of the few airplanes like this that continue to exist in the country. I think both these objects, the casket and the plane, illustrate another important conservation role of the museum. It is not only the physical conservation of the object that is part of our role to, to take on. We understand that the conservation and care of these objects is an important part of what we do. We know that keeping things at the proper room temperature, measuring light levels so they don't get too high, keeping objects clean are all critical part of our responsibilities as the museum and caretakers of these objects. But we also have the role that in that process, we are conserving the essence of these objects for future generations to see and to, to, and to enjoy, and to allow them to connect with an aspect of history they've only read about or seen as part of an online on-air on present, uh, presentation. Having close contact with the object to be able to walk around it, to view it, to see it. It's a much different thing than seeing it online or seeing it in a movie or in a photograph. I think well, that can be a very powerful experience. It's not as impactful as being in the presence of these actual objects as pieces, authentic pieces of the past. Let me give you one more example as an illustration of how the power of this. When giving his speech in Virginia, Lonnie Bunch, 
made mention of the desire of the, of the museum to acquire more objects for its exhibitions. He was overheard by a, her stepfather had inherited an, a Bible and she, she understood the Bible belonged to Nat Turner, who had led a slave rebellion in, Hampton, South, uh, in Southampton, Virginia back in 1831. Some of the ancestors of Maurice Peterson, her stepfather, were killed during that uprising. After the trial, well, after the capture of Nat Turner, after the trial and execution of Turner, his Bible was taken and given to a member of this family. They then kept it for over 200 years as a important memento of that time period in remembrance of their lost relatives. But when they heard the speech given by Lonnie Bunch, they decided that it was now time to donate it to the museum where they thought that it belonged uh, to help tell that story. For us, the authentication process was a very painstaking one to follow because we did not want to get this wrong. Came from that time period, if the paper was of the right type of that time period. We did extensive research looking for photographs and other past illustrations of the Bible and took a number of steps to get a real sense of if in fact this was the right object. Finally, after weeks, oh, next image please. Finally, after weeks of research, we confirmed that indeed it was the Bible of Nat Turner, which you can see here. This is a irreplaceable object. We never thought we could find something as unique and special and um, 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 notable as this object. And, and, it, and it speaks to one, the importance of getting the word out, but also it speaks to our responsibility as an organization in the, in the care and pro, 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 pro preservation of this object. We, uh, once we got it, our conservators had to take over and think about the best way to have the Bible on display because we wanted to share it with the public, but also wanted to make sure we did not harm it. We had to ensure that it was in the right temperature, that the humidity did not fluctuate, and that the lighting was such that it did not cause fading to the object. At the same, same time, we were determined to share this object, this significant artifact with, of history with our visitors. It has had a, a very powerful impact on our visitors and individuals who have come and seen it in the museum. As they've thought about that rebellion, as they've thought about its impact in the history of the United States and the history of African Americans, it becomes again another sort of sacred object in the museum that we are honored to be able to have it as part of what, the, of what we present back to the public. This takes us back to my earlier point about that Newman experience that objects can create for our visitors in museums. Next slide. It is why we have collections and how their conservation and preservation are so crucial to the successful work of any museum, but especially of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Artifacts are the foundation upon which the power of the visitor experience is based in our museum. Linking those experiences with the history associated with them has worked very well as visitor feedback for us has been very positive and very gratifying. And it is important to note that the museum that started with no objects now has more than 40,000 objects in its collection. They represent obviously a challenging workload for our collections conservation staff, but one, a task that they and the museum welcome. We all understand the responsibility that we have to collect, to conserve, and to share the artifacts which are in our care. Without them, important aspects of African-American history would be lost and the experience offered at our museum would not be as impactful. We do see the, ourselves as a consequence of a place where history, where memory and conservation come together in an engaging and informative way for our visitors, and that that becomes the core of how we see the impact our museum can have as a place where history comes together with the imagination and the memories of our visitors. Thank you very much. Wow, Spencer, thank you so much for a really wonderful and informative lecture. Um, I learned a lot. I learned that these experiences I put, that I've been having all my life in museums have a name. They're called the Newman Experience. <laughs> I'm going to have to research that. I, I've just never heard that term before. But you know, I 
lot of museums. I was a museum studies professor at New York University for 16 years before I arrived at UCLA a little over a year ago. Um, I love working with museum, ob with museum objects, which is why I got into conservation in the first place. I just love objects, love working with them behind the scenes. Just going so fast, I've got a lot of questions for you, but okay. you know, I thought I would ask, um, start with asking a question from one of our listeners, uh, mm -hmm. Laura Apple Warren, um, because I was formulating the same question and I realized she had actually asked this. Mm -hmm. You know, you showed us some really powerful objects, the PT 18303 plane, Nat Turner's Bible, and Emmett Till's casket. Um, I mean, that practically brought tears to my eyes, just seeing it. And her question is, I was wondering if Dr. Crew could talk a bit about the ethical dilemmas that arise in deciding which items of material culture are appropriate to exhibit? Are there items that are deemed inappropriate and why? How do museums find the right balance of sharing cultural practices and protecting the rights of indigenous and underrepresented populations? That is a great question and, and not, a, as you could, no, not a simple question to answer. I think part of what we try and do is uh, we are fortunate in that we have a, a, a staff with a wide range of experiences and expertise and we rely, rely greatly upon their experiences, their work and their fields to begin to think about uh, which objects we should in fact bring into the museum which are sort of uh, significant enough, not only locally, but sort of nationally or internationally, that we really should take the time and put in the effort to uh, bring them into the museum and to preserve them. Um, uh, that is not a simple choice to make. And I think it's something that one sharpens over the years and you begin to learn. Um, the question of what we should just collect and not share really has to do, I think, with our understanding of the places from which they come and how they are revered and seen within those communities. And also in conversation with members of those communities as they can sort of share with us how they think we should best think about its preservation and or presentation to the public. And I think those um, conversations are critical along with the experience and the broader knowledge of our staff to see where they connect and where it makes sense to either put something on view or to just preserve it so that others can come in and use it as study material or things they want to make connection with and in later years. Yeah, you know, I think people are interested in what goes on behind closed museum doors. I am, even though I'm often there. Um, it, it might be interesting for people, for our audience to hear, like, how do you arrive at a decision like that? Is it purely curatorial decisions? Do you ever reach out to other scholars or members of the public? Mm -hmm. um, or in this case, maybe, and what kind of research and decision-making goes on? Well, we, I think, reach out to all the sources that you've described. I mean, we rely upon the uh, expertise of our, uh, of our uh, curatorial group and other experts in the museum. They're not all curators, they're experts of all types. Um, we also rely upon information we get from individuals who are looking to donate material to us so we can learn more about them. We, look, we get information from appraisers to tell us whether or not what we are seeing is what we believe they are. And we all, always are talking to other scholars and other experts in that area to again sort of certify what we believe may be true, but we really have to make sure that in fact it is true. Because what we understand is that um, if you bring something into the museum and make it part of the, collect, of the collection, you sort of change its value. You increase its value in certain kinds of ways because it has the stamp of the Smithsonian on it. So we have to be very careful and very thoughtful about Yeah, um, right. I, it's, um, you know, it's just very interesting. And, and it, I, was, I was really struck by your discussion of how objects and memory connect with, with people. Um, and I was also really interested in the process that you described to us of collecting. Um, you didn't just go out and collect, mm 
you actually help people connect with objects that they already owned. And you said that sometimes um, you would acquire them and sometimes not. So, so that work, that whole process um, was helping people connect with the past in, in new ways. I found that really interesting. Um, I've often thought, um, well, worked with um, others, colleagues in museums, in trying to figure out how to connect the public with collection. They've just developed all kinds of new methods and programs. And now, of course, digitally, we can connect people online. Right, right. I'm wondering, did you ever, or do you ever interview these people um, that donate objects to the museum? And then that interview material, could is there potential for exhibiting that or helping people hear the stories from the actual owners of the objects? We do, but it's not interview in the sense of a deep dive interview. Mm -hmm. We're always trying to gather information about the object to give it context. And that becomes part of, I think, the uh, resource that we use as we're creating labels and uh, information that's connected to the object when you put it on display. But also you, you try to create a record in your collections um, storage area on each of the objects in which you add additional information that you've acquired through conversations with the owner or conversations understanding of the object itself. Uh, and it's great reference material for future generations that uh, what we want to make sure is that uh, what we learn is recorded and, and kept so that when someone decides to retire or gets another job that that information doesn't go with them when, when they leave the museum. So those kind of interviews are an important part of what we do. The reverse to that is that we sometimes will do interviews of important individuals and as part of the interview try to have them identify some objects that we might then take into the collection to help uh, help tell their story in a certain kind of way. So there, I think, two different ways in which these kind of conversations can happen. One, when the object comes to us and then we talk to the holder. Other times when we go to the individual who we know have done some important kinds of things and hope that as a consequence of that conversation that we can acquire material culture that allows us to tell their story uh, within the museum or at least preserve it within the museum. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and, you know, about objects, um, the documentation, certainly conservation is very uh, aware of that. And we, we document like crazy before and after photographs, but of course, all the material um, identification, the research on fabrication of objects, history of use. We um, keep all of that information in the museum archives so that um, other researchers can, can use it, and, and some of it can actually then be communicated to the public. Um, we have a question from Gabriel Suk Sukodolsky. Um, that's a, it's a multi-part question. I'll try to distill it. It's about ethnographic fieldwork um, or the material from ethno ethnographic fieldwork. And this question has to do with um, how should individual ethnographers make their fieldwork material available in the archive? Should they curate their material beforehand, anonymize it, or just um, should house ethnographic um, research archives? Um, my first thought is that as much information that you have gained in your work about that material should be assembled and then connected to that material so that there is a, um, a foundation for understanding its importance and its context within the culture from which it comes from. I think that in terms of where the material should go depends upon uh, the culture from which it's been de derived. Um, I'm always of, a, of the belief that, uh, having worked in archives for a long time as well, that uh, the first thing you want to do is to see if you can find an organization or institution uh, geographically nearby that uh, might be able to, to take that in because you want to keep it as close to the source as possible where its real resonance exists. Uh, and take care of it in a proper way so that it does continue to exist many, many years down the, the road. Um, um, 
Uh, and sometimes that may mean going elsewhere, but um, as much as you, as you can connect that material to the cultural group from which it, it, it comes, I think that's the, the best thing to do in most instances. We have another question, which I love from Stephen Geller. Um, I'm interested in how you're gonna answer this one. Uh -oh. What is the role of fiction, poetry, and art in preserving history? <laughs> Fic they, they all are, they all use history often in what they create, in what's created. I think what they offer is another way of understanding the history connected with that art. Tell you something about that era, that culture, the person who created it, um, a wide variety of things. And I think um, it's another tool that can be used as one is trying to capture a historical moment, a historical period, a historical experience. Um, um, Nora would say they're great memories in some ways because they are capturing a person's feeling at the moment but can evolve over time. And they, they evoke memories in people as, as a consequence as well. So that um, I, I think that's how I would think about the role they play in history, but also in memory. Yeah, thank you. Because you know we've been talking about objects, but obviously artistic interpretation of the past is also very valuable and, and certainly as a unit can engage with an artistic interpretation as well. Um, we only have about five more minutes. I'd, I'd like to um, come back to conservation and the work that I do, that uh, mm -hmm. we do. Um, my own doctoral research was in Hawaii and I spent three years engaged with a local community in deciding how an object, the King Kamehameha sculpture, um, in the small town should be conserved. And I used it to model a participatory form of conservation in which we, um, I spoke with many community members, there were lots of meetings and, and, and projects to decide whether the sculpture should be painted as it had been for a long time or gold leafed as it had been originally. And um, we use this question, conservation question of gold leaf versus paint as a way into history to ask, well, who was Kamehameha anyway? And what's his relationship or the native Hawaiian past with the very multicultural present in Hawaii? And now, you know, also my, my colleague, Ellen Perlstein works in her research to engage with, to collaborate with representatives of these collections to share knowledge. So, you know, we do technical research, mm -hmm. um, but that technical research on objects only goes so far in our understanding with them. So we're always looking for collaborations um, with, with people. And I'm wondering if you see that or if your museum does any of that kind of work, um, you know, through educational programs or, or conservation? We, I, I, the short answer is yes. And we do it in a number of different kinds of ways. Uh, we have a very active and engaged education department that is not only having people come into the museum when we're open to the museum to do workshops there, but going out into the community and, and working with them. And part of their workshops were prompted by the fact that teachers asked them to come to them and help them think about how do you look at the issues of African-American history and how do you think about folding that into the day-to-day -day work of, of teachers? So that's one of the ways in which we do it, uh, do that, that kind of work. I think uh, we also are, uh, have been doing some things in, in which there are communities connected with African-American history questions who have asked us to come and be a part of those conversations. Uh, we're doing some work now uh, uh, in Alabama. Uh, um, there's a, uh, a, a, a slave ship that sunk off the coast there, and we Clotilda, and we've been asked to, uh, how to approach its uh, preservation, uh, how to think about how the town should then um, look at that and think about how it should highlight it. 
We've also done things with museums in other parts of the country and the world to look at issues around the slave trade, around um, uh, other kind of questions of, of interest and common concern between the two, the two of us. So that for us, that outreach is a, a critical part of what we do. We actually have a part of our museum called the, the um, Office of Special Projects. And their task is to reach out beyond the walls of the museum and to make contact with other organizations and institutions to be helpful and supportive in the work that they're trying to do as well. Wow, I'm so glad to hear that because it just it feels like these kinds of collaborations are in the air these days. Yes. Um, yes. I meet with so many people that are that are doing it to really, you know, find new ways to engage people with the past. Um, and this is something you've obviously been doing for many, many years now through your curatorial work, your research, your publications, and um, and other forms of outreach. So. Um, Thank you so much. Thank Unfortunately, you. our hour is up, but I do want to thank you um, so much for giving us your time and, and your insights um, into all the great work that you've been doing. And thank just for, for our audience, I'd like to say that this um, lecture has been recorded and it will be made available um, on the UCLA website, the UCLA Getty Conservation website. So thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.